Holiday season and Thanksgiving had been going on depends on where you are on the world. So, what's the animal identical to Thanksgiving? Well, it also varies between region, I guess. But if we're talking about popular media, that would be turkey. So, let me broad up the question. What exactly is turkey? As a person that pays extra attention to etymology, this bird's name is one of the interesting one for me. In English, it's called turkey, probably because the Ottoman Turks trader brought this bird to England. It could also be because it's similar to the guinea vowel, which was known as the turkey cock. What's even more interesting to me is how civilizations from all over the world named this bird. Arabs called them Dikrumi, which basically means bird from Rome. Because in the Islamic world, Ottomans were recognized as Romans. But not everything is about the Turks. In Turkish, it's called Hindi, which indicates it's from India. Dutch called them Kalkun, taken from Kalikut which is the old name of a city in India. I believe several other European languages also call them Kalkun. Indonesian called it Kalkun, probably originated from the Dutch word. Malaysian called them Ayam Belanda, which literally means Dutch chicken. Both countries were colonized by the Dutch, so that's reasonable. French called them Dande, which basically means from India. Slavic people called them Indieku or perhaps Indica, which also basically means from India. Meanwhile, in India and other South Asian countries, it's called Tarki, which, well, yeah, we're looping back. But hey, this is a zoology channel. We could just use their scientific names and no need to be confused with this weird naming sense. Yeah, well, the thing is, their scientific name is Meleagris which is literally the ancient Greek word for the guinea vowel. Yeah, we still couldn't escape the loop. So, surely they originated from Eurasia, right? Well, nope. They are native to North America and Mexico. There are two species of recognized extant turkey. Meleagris galopavo, that's the common wild turkey, which is least concerned and more widespread. Galopavo means chicken peacock. So, yeah, again with the peculiar naming sense. The other one is Meleagris okelata, the oscillated turkey. This one is near threatened and can only be found in the Yucatan Peninsula. They were once classified in their own family, Meleagridae, but nowadays they are classified together in the Fasianidae family. Their position in this family changes over time, but the most recent analysis shows that they are closely related to the grouse especially those in the genus Bonasa and Pucrasia. As with many other members of the family, turkeys are relatively bulky birds with a fan-shaped tail. In fact, wild turkey is the largest extant galliforms, with weight of up to 14 kilograms and may exceed 120 centimeters. Compared to that, the oscillated turkey is only 3 to 5 kilograms on average at around 70 to 122 centimeters, almost half the weight of wild turkey. They have the typical cursorial leg as with other galliforms, because they are mostly terrestrials. Mature males have spur on their legs. Both male and female turkey have caruncles. That's the fleshy extension on their head. These caruncles are significantly more prominent on males. This flappy weightal thing is called dewlap. Meanwhile, this protrusion is called snoot. Snoot is especially more apparent on males because males can extend their snoot. The easiest way to differentiate wild turkey and oscillated turkey is by looking at their head or tail. Wild turkeys have bluish head with a lot of red patches and caruncles. Meanwhile, Oscillated turkeys have mostly blue head with relatively sparse yellow caruncles. If you look at their tail, wild turkeys have brownish tail fan. Meanwhile, oscillated turkeys have this osley pattern, hence their name. The feathers of oscillated turkeys are also significantly more iridescent than the wild turkeys. Wild turkeys have an elongated tuft of feathers called the beard. 
Meanwhile, oscillated turkeys don't. This beard is mostly prevalent in males, but female wild turkeys can also have beard. All in all, wild turkeys are more sexually dimorphic. Females are significantly duller than the males. Meanwhile, oscillated turkeys are less sexually dimorphic. Their feathers are relatively the same between sexes, but of course, males have more prominent caruncles and snoot. Male oscillated turkeys also have enlarged crown during mating season. Depends on who you ask, there are five or six subspecies of wild turkey. Let's talk about the five first, because that's what's more commonly known. These five are Florida wild turkey, aka Osceola wild turkey, Eastern wild turkey, Rio Grande wild turkey, Merriam's wild turkey, and Gould's wild turkey. These five can be differentiated by their coloration, size, calls, and of course, distribution. If you compare them to each other, you could tell them apart by their tail coloration. It gets lighter from left to right, but it really depends on the lighting so it's not easy to compare. There is a nice illustration by Tanner Street on this, distributions included. I'll leave the link in the description so you can check it out if you are curious. But hold on, I did say there are six subspecies. What about that one? Well, the last one, or perhaps I should say the first one, is South Mexican wild turkey. This one was domesticated into the, well, domestic turkey. The one that people throughout the world was most familiar with. I'll talk about the domestication later in this video. Let's talk about their lifestyle first. But before that, Like I said before, turkeys are mostly terrestrials, which is why they eat things that can be found on the ground, like insects, spiders, worms, snails, frogs, stuff like that. They also eat grains. Basically, they are opportunistic omnivores. Although mostly terrestrials, they can also fly for short distances, usually to escape potential danger or to roost on a tree. They rest on trees because it's safer there. They groom themselves by dusting, coating them with dirt to clean their feathers. They also bask under the sun and preen their feathers to remove dirt and damage feathers. Although most of the time they will flee when in danger, they could also counterattack by kicking and using their spurs, especially if cornered. Males are polygamous. They court females by showing a display called strutting. Basically, they walk while gobbling and puffing their feathers and caruncles. Blood will rush to their caruncles so the caruncles will be swollen. That's also why they can extend their snoot. And for oscillated turkeys, that's why their crown is enlarged. Males usually strut in group. The non-dominant males will usually follow the dominant when strutting. Mating season can start in February, but usually peaks at March to April. After mating, Females will make a nest on the ground and lay their eggs, usually one egg per day. They lay around 8 to 15 eggs each breeding season. This egg will be incubated for at least 28 days and will hatch around May to June. Hatchlings will leave the nest within a day and follow their mother until they become young adults. They will usually stay in a flock of same sexes. In winter, Different flocks can combine so you can see 30 or even up to 50 turkeys together. There are several fossils that might be related to turkeys dating back to Miocene, but the generally accepted fossils of true turkeys are Meleagris californica and Meleagris crassipes. Both of these fossils are from the Pleistocene layer. Meleagris crassipes was found in northern Mexico. Meanwhile, Meleagris californica was found in California. Size-wise, both are smaller than the extant jerky. And that's basically it, at least that I know of. There's not much ancient turkey fossils available, so we don't really know about their evolution. But what we do know is their domestication, to some extent that is. So let's talk about it. The first domestication of turkey happened in pre-Columbian Mesoamerica. As I've stated before, they domesticated the South Mexican subspecies. You could find that information basically everywhere. The thing is, 
What most articles or videos don't tell you is, this information is actually not conclusive. We know that the domestication happened at least 2,000 years ago, but we cannot pinpoint the range. That's because the bones of supposed domestic turkey that we can find from sites of that age are morphologically similar to the wild turkey. The bones that we found were also relatively sparse. That probably means domestic turkey is not that relevant to humans' life at that time. Not yet, at least. It was hypothesized that turkeys were kept for sacrificial offerings and other rituals. They could also be consumed when foods are relatively scarce. That's why they are not selectively bred for consumption. Hence, they are very similar and practically indistinguishable from the wild turkey. Ancient mitochondrial DNA analysis also shown that there was another distinct domestication in the southwest. This one was domesticated from the eastern or Rio Grande subspecies, not the South Mexican subspecies. This one shows genetic bottleneck, which indicates strong selection pressure. So yeah, the domestication of turkey is actually more complex than what most people know. Further evidence could lead us to a more precise answer. We'll see if we find some more archaeological discovery. Because Turkey is native to the North America and Mexico, the rest of the world basically don't know about them for hundred or even thousands of years. That is until the early 1500s. What happened? Well, here comes the conquistador. Turkeys were brought to Europe by the Spanish. Soon enough, it became popular among the aristocrats. Turkeys supposedly arrived in England back in 1541. And if you didn't notice, that's even before the colonization of North America by the English settlers. Turkeys were a popular holiday dish, and so they were bred in England. So, a lot of you might be familiar with the pilgrim. English settlers brought the Mayflower ship. They brought some domestic turkey as supplies. But it doesn't last forever, of course. Supposedly, at around September to November 1621, they were given food supplies by the Native Americans. And so they feast. Among those are wild turkeys, not even the domestic one. We're looping back to the origin. And that's the start of the Thanksgiving association with turkeys in the USA. Oversimplified, that is. Some said there were no turkeys at all during the feast. I'm not a history channel. I'm probably wrong in many ways, but there should be some videos talking about the history already. So what's those for the historical information? Anyway, as more settlers arrived, their habitats got turned into farmlands. Not only that, people also hunt them to be consumed. They are somewhat easy target after all. The populations keep declining. And so, by the early 1900s, wild turkeys were almost extinct. There was no real conservation effort for a while, which is understandable of course, because, you know, world wars were happening. But around 1960s to 1970s, conservation efforts were made. Wild turkeys were trapped and reintroduced into states where they went extinct. Good news is, the efforts were successful. Since 1973, the National Wild Turkey Federation has been dedicated to wild turkey conservation and the preservation of our hunting heritage. That's literally taken word to word from their website, by the way. As I've stated before, wild turkey is currently considered least concerned. There are millions of wild turkeys in the wild. Talking about this makes me wonder. Did the people of National Wild Turkey Federation celebrate this success by eating turkeys? as per tradition, or not. All in all, Turkey has quite the history, both natural and cultural, and now it's associated with this festive season. Who knows, maybe someday we'll find a lot more fossil records, so we'll figure out their evolution. If you already celebrated Thanksgiving several weeks ago, then I hope you had a good day. If you haven't, then I hope you will have a good day. If you don't celebrate Thanksgiving, then I hope you have a good day anyway. That's all for now. Oh, by the way, some domestic turkey breeds have a significantly larger breast so they cannot fly. Just like what happened to some domestic chicken breed. Anyway, enjoy your day. <laughs>